Okay, we're back from the break, uh, and uh, as I said at the beginning of the show, I'm Dr. Michael Reiner, um, and this is my uh, co-host, Dr. Steve Tavern. Uh, he's an interventional cardiologist and been in Pahrump for, my God, I don't know. Long time. Long time, longer than I have been. 17 years. Yeah. Um, wow. And uh, yeah. 17 years. you can say time flies yeah. when you're having yeah. fun, right? Um, at any rate, I want to remind the viewing audience, this is a live show, so if you do have a question, we do have some Facebook posts, and we're appreciating for that. Uh, but if you do want to call in, that number is 727-8750. Again, 727-8750. Uh, um, and if you do have a uh, question, uh, please uh, you know, call in. And if you have a comment uh, that's derogatory, please keep those to yourself. Um, we have valuable time to spend and, and uh, don't want to deal with, with uh, those issues. Um, Anyway, one of the things we talked about at the break between you and I was uh, the lead-in to um, the Affordable Care Act, um, um, which they so conveniently call it now, um, and that lifestyle change that, that we talk about, which is everything in moderation, um, because what I'm starting to see in my practice is a, a, the 7.5 million people that supposedly have signed up for the Affordable Care Act, what I'm seeing is a large number of Medicaid patients. Yes, um, in this state. In this state. Yeah. Um, now, I don't know, but very few are going to the exchange and getting um, insurance um, that they can actually afford because it's not affordable. Um, yeah. And um, so the comment that, I, that I'm making to you as a, as a community is, is that the, the state of Nevada um, did take the federal money to increase uh, Medicare and but Medicaid. Medicaid. Yeah. But I don't see that. I don't see that lasting. Um, and and uh, I tell patients that if you have Medicaid, which I think it's a good thing because some people can get things done, but you know um, down the road, I just I, it, it's an unsustainable model. Um, and I and um, what will happen is is that is as physicians see more and more of this this type of population, what's going to happen is it's going to be harder to get into a doctor. At least my prediction will be. And again what will happen is the most exp expensive point of service will be occupied by the patients that have some insurance. It means the ERs will be crowded um, with people who can't get in a doctor because the doctor no longer wants to take Medicaid because the reimbursement is, is decreased on, on some level. Um, so I just see it's so important to modify your lifestyle and take care of your diseases um, because um, you just don't know what medicine is going to be like in five years, ten years. And would you agree with that statement? I agree. The the uh, what I've seen in my practice, which is a a little different than Mike's, because I'm generally dealing with an older and sicker population. Uh, I've taken care of a of a number of patients here in town that have had no insurance. Yeah. And we kind of sneak them into the office and do do very little testing, uh, give samples of drugs whenever we can. Some of them. Uh, have gotten on Medicaid. It's standard. It's standard Medicaid. Medicare work. Medicaid works fine with me. Yeah, and um, they're getting the care they need. The patients that I've been extraordinarily disappointed with are the ones that have affordable health care, <laughs> which I think is the newest oxymoron in the English language. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've got only three or four patients with with affordable health care. And all three of them have told me the same story. They make a little too much to qualify for Medicaid. They don't make enough that they can afford insurance. They don't make enough that they're putting money away. And every one of them has exactly the same plan. Their premiums are between two to $300 a month, which isn't bad. Mm -hmm. But their co-pays, they, their deductibles, I'm sorry, are a minimum of $6,000 a year. So if you look at $6,000 a year being 500 a month, they're paying $10,000 a year for their insurance. Wow. If they had the money, and that deductible is they have to pay that $6,000 before insurance kicks in. Mm -hmm. Insurance will then kick in 100%. Right. So what they have is catastrophic insurance. They don't have office-based insurance, and they're the way they were before. Uh, the, the press... Uh, in its inimitable fashion, has chosen to completely ignore this mm -hmm. and give, give great kudos to affordable health care. And I think if you could afford to buy the Platinum Plan, which has a much lower deductible, that's more affordable. But again, if you can afford the Platinum Plan, you can afford Aetna, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, anything else. Right. So the, the, the advent of affordable health care 
um, is not affordable, but this is happening on a patient-by-patient -patient basis. When one looks globally, yes, there are a lot of patients insured, but they're insured with policies that they can afford, but they can't afford to get health care with it. They can't they, afford the deductible either. They can, that's what I mean. Yeah. They can, they can afford the premium, but they can't afford to use it. Right. It's, like, it's like going out and, and having someone give you a Mercedes for $10,000, but you don't have the money for gas. And certainly not for repairs. And certainly not for repairs. So that, that, that's very frustrating. Um, it's very frustrating to us because we, we like giving our patients the best care we can. And, and in cardiology especially, uh, we have some pretty high ticket items that we have to do. Mm -hmm. And the hospitalizations, the angiograms, and everything else. And, and in reality, if you didn't, if you never had health insurance, you could still get treatment. In fact, if you go to the emergency room today, they can't ask you for your health insurance until after they've seen you and no. treated you. So, I mean, they can't discriminate you because of that. Federal law. Federal law. So, Federal law. in reality, uh, you know, it's not affordable. Anyway, we have a caller on the on the line. His, his name is Frank. Is uh, do we? Um, who's listening to that? Caller, you're, go ahead. He's on delay. Frank, go ahead, sir. Frank. Are you there? Yes, go ahead, ask your question. I have been prescribed diastolic low blood pressure pills. I'd like to know if there is a generic that will do the same thing. You said you have bistolic? That's correct. Who are you? Yes. How old are you? Five milligrams. No, how, how old are you, not how much do you take? Your age. I can't hear you. We're going to ask him how old he is. Yes, we'd like to know your age, sir. How old are you? 78 years old. Okay. There, there are bistolics a beta blocker. Mm -hmm. It's in the same family as atenolol and metoprolol and bisoprolol, uh, propranolol. Bistolic is the only one that is not generic, which I think is the question Frank is asking. Bistolic has a couple differences from the other beta blockers, and these are unique differences. By, and, that's, and that's differences of side effect. Uh, bistolic does not cause the fatigue that other people feel with the other beta blockers. Uh, and I hope this applies to you, Frank, because I want it to apply to me when I'm 78. <laughs> bistolic does not have the side effect of erectile dysfunction that the other beta blockers have. And obviously, if you're looking at a 35-year-old like Dr. Reiner, oh, uh, this, is, this is a huge difference. And we put a lot of patients from other beta blockers <coughs> to bistolic um, because they complain of side effects of fatigue and or side effects of erectile dysfunction. But to answer your question, Frank, yes, there are a number of generics. The one that I use is a drug called bisoprolol, uh, Z-beta was the trade name. Uh, some of the pharmacies have a problem, I can't understand why, getting, getting the pure bisoprolol, and it comes as a combination drug with a very low amount of hydrochlorothiazide, a water pill called Zyac, that everybody has. Mm -hmm. And Zyac is one of the, the $10 for three month drugs. Uh, when patients come in, as you do, Frank, looking at cost versus efficacy, unless they've had a side effect from another beta blocker, I put them all in bisoprolol. If for some reason you're getting a better outcome with bistolic, i.e. you don't have those side effects, what I do is write the prescription for twice as much. Mm -hmm. You know, the pill is triangular shaped, it breaks in half so easily, you can do it with your fingernails and it costs the same no matter what the dose. So just simply giving you 10 milligrams instead of five milligrams, writing it down one a day, dispense 30 or dispense 90, 
cuts the cost 50% because you're getting twice as much out of it. Yeah. That's one trick I do when people I want to keep on Bistolic. Mm -hmm. uh, I put most of them, though, with your request automatically on Bisoprolol, and I would guess 90% of the patients right. and do I love, very well. And I love um, Bistolic just because of what I've seen with regards to COPD patients, um, how because it's even more selective, uh, because it has that um, alpha component that does uh, cause uh, vasodilatation, which does prevent some of those side effects. Um, but the breathers do very well on it. Yeah. And, and so um, if you have had an issue with smoking in the past, or and most people have, um, any element of COPD, um, it's a great drug for, for that a, patient too. It's a very good drug. And, and Frank, not to belabor this, but... Um, there's a warning on all the beta blockers to be either very careful or not use them in patients who have asthma. Sometimes we need beta blockers because we're, I'm dealing with coexisting cardiac disease where I need a beta blocker. And although this is anecdotal and my practice is certainly not as big as a lot of the studies, uh, I've never had a patient with asthma that I've used Bistolic on that's had a problem, but the next drug to Bistolic is Bisoprolol. Yeah, what about carvedilol? Carvedilol is about as bad as you can get with asthma. Okay. okay. So, so I, I have no problem, Frank, suggesting that if you were my patient, either I would have you break the drug in half, depending on how you like it, or putting you on bisoprolol. Okay, we're gonna, coming up on a break, but we have caller Ken on the line. Um, and we'll take Ken's question and then um, probably end up going to break here in a few minutes. Ken? Ken? Hello, am I on the air? Yes. Uh, hello, Mike. Uh, this is Ken. Uh, in my 50 years of related healthcare experience, so you maybe recognize my voice, one thing I see that's not being mentioned with the ACA and the increased number of people signing on for Medicaid is when a patient believes that their treatment is absolutely free, increased utilization, decreased availability of services, and as such, we're going to increase the workload for our primary care physicians. We're going to end up having fewer enrolled in medical school, which has already been shown to be true, and we're going to end up having gatekeepers that are not unqualified, but less qualified than primary care physicians. So it's more of a comment than really a question. And I appreciate the two of you on the air. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you for calling. We could not agree more with Ken. That's correct. <laughs> and there's lots of different twists to this uh, so-called Affo Affordable Care Act. But uh, being on the front lines, um, I, I'm, I'm happy to give care to people who have not had that. I, I think they feel better um, about having the ability to come into the doctor. They, they respect what we do. They respect us to be paid for what we do. Um, and they avoid us when they can't, you know, when they have no health insurance. But I, I look at the cost of, 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 of coming into a, a doctor's office, and really we make up such a small portion of what the actual cost of health care really is. Um, you know, if you fill up your tank nowadays, um, and it's a standard tank, um, you know, you're spending fifty dollars at the gas at the uh, forty to fifty dollars. Um, how often do you go to the doctor? I mean, to put out, you know, sixty to eighty dollars for a visit to the doctor's office. Um, yes, the testing is expensive, and yes, these things. But to get advice, to get some labs done reasonably, to get your your. I mean, you would wouldn't need to do that more than a couple of times during the year to get that advice. It's not that expensive. But when they calculate the cost of health care, they add in Advil. They add in every over the counter prescription aid. Anything is done, you know, estimates the cost of health care. But seeing a physician, it's not as bad as, as, as people would guess. It's only when you venture into the emergency room that that standard, that standard visit, and I've gotten one, it's $1,000. It's $1,000. And we're actually nicer people than people think we are, too. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're, we're fun people to be with. Yeah. We're the doctors of Perump. Yeah, we're the doctors of Perot. That's yep. right. All right, we're going to go to break, and when we come back, we'll be on our last segment. Thank you for being here tonight with us. Thank you.